Okay, I think we'll start. Uh, time is just past one o'clock in the afternoon here in Stockholm, where I'm based. Uh, my name is Marcus Lind, and I work for Smart Innovation Norway. And we would all like to welcome you to this webinar called Nordic Climate Budgeting Pioneers, Best Practice, Tools and Processes. And there are still people coming in, uh, but we need to uh, stick to our schedule. And I would like to inform everyone that this is recorded and will be made available afterwards. So this is our schedule. And I, first I would like to um, give the word to Scott Allison from uh, Clean Denmark, who is the project manager of uh, Nordic Solutions for C40. Oh. Thanks, Marcus. I'll just uh, we'll share my screen. Cool. As uh, Marcus introduced, um, this kind of uh, this webinar session is uh, kind of supported and co-hosted by Nordic Solutions for C40, which is a partnership, um, a Nordic partnership. Uh, platform project, which is being co-financed co by Nordic Innovation as part of their uh, Council of Ministers Sustainable Cities program. Um, and basically just give you a quick overview of this and to where why we are here today. Uh, so basically the Nordic Solutions for C40 uh, platform has been established since um, 2018 uh, for all the five Nordic countries together working specifically on uh, trying to bridge this gap and connect between uh, and have clean tech kind of collaboration across the Nordics cross-border kind of collaboration uh, and one of the main aims of this is actually connecting with cities uh, within the Nordics international cities etc for knowledge sharing and also to look at supporting kind of the processes that links into the technology development, research development, and actually accelerate some of the uh, green transition towards some of these climate uh, ambitions that we have. Uh, and I know this webinar is specifically around the climate budgeting, which is part of that. Um, we facilitate the kind of involvement of these kind of uh, ecosystems um, in these different types of opportunities uh, and kind of support where relevant uh, the different partners across the Nordics and kind of bridging basically cross-border collaboration. And you can see the partners here. We are completely across the Nordics. So it's, um, as Marcus says, Clean has been leading this project, but we have uh, Innovation Norway and Smart Innovation Norway from uh, yeah, from Norway, uh, the Swedish Agency for Economic Growth. Uh, we have Promote Iceland and also Business Finland. Uh, who we all work together on this platform. Uh, it's been co-financed by Nordic Innovation, as I said, as part of their uh, Nordic Solutions for Global Challenges um, and their Nordic Sustainable Cities Initiative. Uh, and we have this strategic partnership with um, C40 and C40 Cities in terms of uh, connecting Nordic expertise and Nordic knowledge into the more bigger global network of C40 and vice versa, getting some of the uh, knowledge and exchange back into the Nordics from this big network of global cities. Uh, we've also partnered up with uh, Nordic Heat, uh, kind of a platform around specifically around energy and heat, which is predominantly European, uh, as a kind of partner, knowledge sharing partner. Uh, and basically this value that we have is that we are an established network uh, and partners that are used to working together. Uh, that have a big broad spectrum of network companies, research institutes, other organizations and cities themselves. Uh, and we are basically on a process of working and developing tools to assist uh, where the, the clusters and the business promotion agencies and the organizations like Innovation Norway and Business Finland fit in that ecosystem. Where can we support each other? Uh, this, this this project is, uh, as such, is coming to an end, but the platform is still here. 
uh, it's still going to be uh, the partners will still be willing to work together and put into the ecosystem what we work with. So that's basically why this collaboration platform started is to make us work better together. So I'm happy for this uh, webinar. I'm looking forward to hearing more from the speakers today. So Marcus. Thanks, Scott. Mm. I'll just move on to short presentation of Smart Innovation Norway, where I work. And uh, it's all about new, new sustainable jobs and a green change for current and future generations. And this is all of us working at Smart Innovation Norway. We're quite a diverse group, uh, around 45 people from uh, 15 countries working with research and innovation and uh, um, to get um, new knowledge out into the society as applied, uh, applied research and then applying it into, into real world settings. So we're a nonprofit research organizations uh, we're based in Halden uh, at the southern border to uh, uh, Sweden, next to the university. And uh, as I said, we're based on research, but we also host two clusters, one on smart energy markets and one for applied AI. We have one of the best incubators in Norway. We have a leading smart city department where uh, Mikael and I um, work and we have a simulator center and communication department. So together we're, we're an innovation platform. Um, and we're strong in these areas, sustainable energy, applied artificial intelligence, smart cities and communities, and digital entrepreneurship. So our job is to, um, bridge the gap between challenges and uh, value creation, sustainable value creation, like new jobs and green change. So that's what we do. We have a quite uh, successful research department. We've uh, managed uh, 14 Horizon Europe, uh, Horizon 2020 projects since 2009. And that's, that's a lot compared, even compared to the bigger research institutes in Norway. Uh, we have our cluster for smart energy markets with a lot of uh, different actors. We have an incubator who um, helps the companies in these clusters and other companies related uh, to grow. And uh, we have our new AI cluster. Sorry, I'm trying to let people in at the same time here. <laughs> um, and then we have our smart cities and communities department. And we work in close collaboration with municipalities on these uh, topics. And we have sustainability and cooperation in quadruple helix programs and uh, new technology as our main drivers. So we work with 15 uh, municipalities around uh, Norway. And now we're also establishing our activities in Sweden uh, and um, Denmark, and Finland um, soon. So we have a high focus on operational projects in close collaboration with the municipalities. So we have a quite unique portfolio of um, implemented innovation projects in cities. And that's it from my side. Um, so I will Ask you, James, to share your screen real quick. Thanks. Thank you. I've been muted that whole time. <laughs> I just wanted to say, yeah, I was I was saying how quick and ready I was to, to share my screen, but that was lost with the with the mute. Um, and yeah, introduce myself. My name's James Armour. Uh, I'm sitting in Scotland right now, I'm from Scotland, but I work for Clean. I'm a colleague of Scots, as we're based in Copenhagen, uh, and I actually primarily work with the International Clean Tech Network. So Clean is a triple helix cluster 
and we have 15 other clusters around the world that we work with uh, on a daily basis and we're working together uh, to enable the implementation and the acceleration of, uh, of green society. Um, here is a little map of where we are based. We're predominantly in Europe, but we've got a few members in the Americas uh, and our members in South Africa just down there. And you can see that amongst the 16 clusters, we represent quite a lot of different cities, research institutes, a lot of SMMEs. Uh, SMEs are the bread and butter of most clusters. And collectively, we're involved in quite a lot of different uh, projects. Um, for those of you who don't know, it sounds like everyone's very familiar with the cluster, but it's the triple helix of uh, private companies, public authorities, research institutes, trying to work together to create space, uh, value in the space between. And us as the International Clean Tech Network, we really come in to try and see how your cluster and your region can cooperate with other clusters abroad uh, to open the doors to lots of different things from, from a city perspective, maybe knowledge sharing, uh, from a company perspective, maybe a new market. This is kind of the important slide that I put together for everyone here today. I think this is really the value for you as a city, people listening in, uh, these three points here. Innovation is, an, and sorry, it's all underpinned by the fact that you could really see the cluster as an extension of your resources. Uh, of course, normally clusters are quite small. I know Clean has like 40 employees, which is a lot uh, in Denmark, but for other clusters, maybe it's five, maybe it's three. I've even met one. So it can be a big, big scale. Uh, which is a lot smaller than the city, but I really think that it can be seen as an extension of your resources to help you on these three sort of points. Uh, one being innovation. So a lot of what Clean have been doing and what the ICN are trying to do more so is facilitating these challenges or issues, you could say, uh, being, being faced in cities and with corporates and trying to connect that with the private sector, with researchers, with innovative SMEs, uh, rather than just the usual you know, run-of-the-mill large companies which take most of the contracts. The second point here is all about knowledge sharing. So how can you potentially work with cities abroad? There's a lot of dedicated networks like C40, for example, that do this kind of thing. And they'll have their very specific targeted uh, webinars and explanations, and like the one we're in just now, where you can learn a lot more about what cities are doing abroad and best practices and so forth. Uh, but certainly your cluster uh, and through the sort of work we do at the ICN, uh, we're, we're trying to make sure that we can also assist on this link. And the last one is all about project development and funding. Um, and I'm only saying this one because we recently submitted and, and have in the past as well, a grant to a European fund with the city of Rotterdam, uh, Bornholm, which is an island between Denmark and Germany uh, and Bilbao. And that was all about enabling SMEs to get more involved in public procurement. Uh, so there's actually 3 million euros earmarked in this project. If we receive it, so we've, the, the money's not come through yet, but for these cities to, to actually um, procure solutions within waste management. So again, this was driven by the clusters and there's more initiatives like this that go on. So really you can see this as uh, and clusters and cluster networks as uh, sort of an extra set of hands in your organization, I would say. Sorry, I spoke really quickly, but I tried to keep it as short as possible. So that's everything from me today. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Uh, Gauta, you're up next. I will share my screen as you don't have any slides. Yes. Hello, can you see me and hear me? Am I there? Yes, we can see you. Well, we can't see you now, but we can hear you. Great, but you can hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. So thank you for inviting me. My, my name is Gauta Hagerup. I am uh, the... Um, the head of the newly established uh, C40 Oslo uh, C40 office in Oslo and C40 is the world's largest climate network it consists of 97 mega cities uh, who together are fighting uh, to um, achieve the 1.5 degree uh, target of the paris agreement and the special thing about C40 is it uh, that it is commitment at the mayoral level so it is they are really able to make decisions uh, and make things happen. They represent altogether 10% of the population of the earth and 25% of the global GDP. So it is my belief that C40 are really able to make, uh, make a change on a global scale when it comes to the climate, uh, the fight for the climate change. 
And so just a few, I'm going to be really, really quick here. Just a few words about uh, how we work and what we do. Um, the last four years, all the members in C40 have, um, have uh, participated in a process called Deadline 2020, meaning that all the cities have made plans, action plans that were supposed that are supposed to be uh, committed from 2020 uh, and to cut emissions, CO2 emissions from 2020 and onwards towards 2030. And so far, uh, a majority of the cities have uh, those plans uh, in place. A few have asked for a um, postponement a couple of months into 2021, but it is quite powerful, the action, the climate action plans that are now are ready uh, to be implemented in all these cities. And of course, in order to do so, you need, you really need um, to implement climate considerations in every key decisions being made at the top level in both at the city level, but also in the agencies and companies outside or in, within the municipality, but also uh, among uh, other corporations uh, in, in, and, and institutions in the city. And so this part is what we call mainstreaming. That's climate mainstreaming means how do we implement climate considerations into every key decisions being made from the top senior level and downwards in the organization. And I guess climate budgeting is one uh, pioneering tool into that, but there are of course other tools as well. Uh, but today is about climate budgeting and uh, the C40 Oslo office is having this as it's uh, one of its uh, tasks to, to work on within the C40 uh, network, uh, meaning mainstreaming. How, how do we succeed with that? I think it's really interesting to see uh, Joe Biden's uh, plan and, and all the 17 executive orders that he, he signed up already yesterday. And I know that he decided that in his cabinet, climate considerations should be a part of every consideration from all his cabinet members and all the federal agencies. That is among one among those um, executive orders. One of those executive orders, orders I know that he signed was that federal agencies shall procure um, zero emission uh, transportation vehicles, for example. So I think that's really, really interesting to see what's happening now. And uh, the concept of climate mainstreaming is really now, I think as, I think we see it, it, it is evolving around us. And uh, so climate budgeting is one thing, but, but green procurement is also of course, another very important tool for mainstreaming uh, climate, uh, climate considerations into decision-making. So um, I think I'm gonna leave it there. I think this webinar is, uh, is important because uh, we are standing in front of uh, an era where climate considerations need to be a part of every key decisions being made. And the climate budget is an excellent tool for that. So uh, thank you for inviting me and I wish you a great uh, webinar. Thanks a lot, Kelta. Um... Just a quick uh, reminder of the schedule for any newcomers here. We will soon hear from Uppsala University and then from our two cities and then from three service providers. And I will have a discussion in our breakout session uh, where you can choose the most relevant session directly in Zoom. Uh, so now I would like to give the word to Isaac and Martin. Thank you, I will start. Um, so, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Martin Wettstedt from the Climate Change Leadership Node at Uppsala University. And I will uh, share this presentation with, with Isaac Stoddard who <coughs> um, will uh, continue half through the presentation more or less. So first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, and us. It's, uh, it's a really interesting um, group of people to, to speak to and present to. Um, let's see if it changes the picture. All right. Um, 
just a quick introduction to what we are going to talk about. Um, as you might be aware of, there's different uses and meanings of carbon budgets and, and uh, climate budgets. We have uh, today some, some interesting different examples. And the perspective we will talk about is, is one of them. Um, it could be called the Tyndall Center um, method for calculating local carbon budgets, but it, um, I guess the, the name hasn't been fixed altogether yet, so that it, it might change what it what it uh, it will be called uh, yet <clears throat> but but just to, to, to be sure uh, carbon budget is not exactly the same as climate budgets um, as you will learn today and there's um, some variations to this and i wanted to start off with a, a brief history of climate targets because the way the climate challenge has been uh, framed has, has changed over the years, as maybe some of you have, have noticed specifically. So, and, and, and this is actually from a, a great blog post on, on Carbon Brief, which I'm, I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. So if we look back to 1990, there were, was a discussion about stabilization of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. <clears throat> Further on in Kyoto, uh, it was more discussed about we discussed emission cuts. How much do we need to cut to become sustainable or to stabilize um, the climate? Then uh, there were a discussion about atmospheric concentrations. Some of you might know the, the organization of uh, 350.org who focused, took their name out of this sort of framing of, of, of the challenge. After in, in 2011 and 12, uh, the concept about, uh, of, of cumulative budgets became more predominant. Uh, and it was also seen in the shift from the IPCC report from the version five um, to the version, uh, from the version four to five. Uh, the framing was also seen there. And then in the Paris Agreement, there's more focus on actually the, the, the outcomes, the temperature outcomes. So how does that affect uh, city, um, city targets and national targets for, for that uh, sake? Well, uh, partly uh, of this talk will focus on this transition. Let's slow the animation. Uh, that took place between this framing of emission cuts to cumulative budgets. If you, uh, when you do uh, modeling of global warming, uh, it's really done in, in, the, in the sequence of emissions, lead to concentration, increase in the atmosphere, increased concentration of greenhouse gases leads to forcing a warming effect. effect. Well, the forcing is kind of an insulation and that leads to temperature increase. So this really follows a little bit of how um, the challenge has been framed. We had first a discussion about we need to cut our uh, emissions and then we need to focus on the concentration. Um, then with the carbon budgets, it was concluded that there is a direct link between emissions and warming, a, a linear link, which I will come to in the next slide. So that's the sort of underpinning science between the carbon budgets. And then um, with the Paris Agreement, the discussion was further focused on temperatures, but which is closely linked to the carbon budgets. So this is just a, an, an, an illustration of if we have, we, if we start uh, at the, it's uh, year zero uh, to the left in the picture and, and start emitting CO2, CO2 every year at the same level, this will be a linear uh, increase in the concentration, almost linear increase in the forcing and, and very close to linear increase in the warming. So it doesn't really matter when in time the emissions are. So that makes that sort of, is the underpinning of, of, of why we can talk about carbon budgets. And going to the IPC report, uh, this is also uh, pictured or mirrored here, that it's, it's, it's the cumul cumulative emissions of CO2 that large, largely determine global mean surface warming by the late 21st century and beyond. That doesn't mean that other greenhouse gases are not important, but they're not as dominant in the longer scale. Uh, 
looking at again at the IPCC report, this is how it's represented in, in the table 2.2. Uh, this is actually from, from the latest report. Uh, but as you see, there's um, different uh, numbers of, of total accumulated carbon emissions that correlate to, to different temp temperatures with, with, of course, some uncertainties because that's always there in, in these models and predictions. So if we make this more tangible and discuss what does this mean in practice? Well, it means that if we, we have a emission curve, we need to go down to, to zero carbon emissions eventually. The area under, under the curve is the, the carbon budget. And if we deviate from, from sort of one, one scenario and, and emit more in the beginning, the, the area under the curve A, uh, then we need to compensate for that by emitting less later on. Which of course makes it uh, even a bigger of a challenge because it's already, as you, yes, as you know, very challenging to, today to decrease emissions. And of course, from this, you can plot different curves that if you, if we would have started the transition earlier on, um, we could have had a much smoother transition. But the longer we uh, prolong our decision or our um, actions um, to, 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 to reach sort of zero carbon, then the, the, the steeper the curve will need to be to keep within the budget. All right, uh, um, Isaac will share his screen now, so there will be a, a really short break. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. yes. Perfect. Great. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and greetings, everyone. Um, currently, I'm speaking to you from Harjedalen, which is uh, just on the other side of the border from Norway in Sweden. I guess it used to belong to Norway. So sorry for stealing it back from you. For uh, very sorry about that. Uh, I'm here in my cabin, um, and I'm going to pick up a little bit where um, where Martin left off. Um, I guess just a, a brief uh, uh, word about myself. Some of you probably read the bio that was sent out before the meeting, but um, I am pursuing a PhD within, uh, within the field of climate change and energy transitions, looking specifically um, at how this is playing out at the regional level in Sweden. Um, and so it's a pleasure to be here with you today. My background's in engineering physics, but I spent the last 10 years uh, dipping into all sorts of different disciplines and, and areas of study. So I'm very interdisciplinary. One could say, and have yeah, different forms of knowledge that informs the work that I that I do. Um, the the contribution that I want to make here is to exemplify a little bit what Martin just spoke about. Um, uh, we published a paper uh, myself together with with two British colleagues, Kevin Anderson and John Broderick, uh, back in May, where we uh, basically took as our starting point the Paris Agreement um, and also the IPCC's latest report and combine the, the quantification of the remaining carbon budget that correlates then to the, the temperature commitments in the Paris Agreement, and use those to, to go from the global level down to the national level and look at two of the most uh, so-called progressive um, industrialized countries in the world, uh, the UK and Sweden, at least in terms of how uh, they've de developed uh, legislation and policy a few years ago when we started the research. And, and looked at basically how well their, their, their climate legislation and their policy frameworks uh, live up to the commitments that are enshrined in the Paris Agreement. Um, so we really tried to take the, the commitments in the Paris Agreement at face value, and that means that we both try to base it on the latest science, which uh, we, or the best available science, which we then argue is, is, is the carbon budgets as quantified by the IPCC. Uh, but also a clear acknowledgement of the equity um, uh, principles underpinning the Paris Agreement. Um, it's mentioned, I think, well, 27 or 28 times or something like that. I can't remember exactly 
the the exact number, but it's it's clearly underpinning the idea. And basically, one of the when it comes to mitigation, of course, uh, and decreasing emission, this means that uh, the wealthier industrialized countries with much higher emissions per capita and also much higher historical emissions have a bigger responsibility to to decrease their emissions uh, at a more rapid rate and earlier than than uh, developing countries, um, as they're called um, in UN lingo. And I guess this also connects to the C40 work. I know that you've done a bit of work in the deadline 2020 um, uh, report that, I, that I've that i read, at least. Uh, you, you discussed these principles of equity and, and land in that the, the sort of the contract and convergence approach is the one that you go with. So it's, I think it's really interesting to have this discussion here because what we've tried to do is, is find uh, you know a, a reasonable interpretation of equity that we can use to, to quantify the remaining emission space for, for all of the world's countries. Um, and I guess one could uh, also um, say that another one thing that I guess is why we did this analysis in this way and why we sort of stick to this is that a lot of the, the analysis that's done on the global level um, disregards equity, uh, either <laughs> Uh, unintentionally or intentionally, I would say, just because it just makes the issue and the challenge so much more difficult for countries like uh, like ours. I, I'm not sure where which country countries people are from in this call, but if you're from an industrialized country with uh, with quite high GDP per capita, uh, those are the countries I'm speaking about. Um, and uh, a lot of the other sort of conceptualizations, like the global car uh, carbon law by Rockström et al., etc. Uh, they they tend to not uh, explicitly talk about equity and and also that risks you know uh, falling away when you when you sort of go from the global level down to the local level. So we thought it's important to keep that in. Um, our analysis does also not rely upon uh, unproven and highly uncertain so-called negative emission technologies, and this is basically um, I think a huge issue to discuss because basically all policy that's currently de being developed. Uh, relies on planetary scale deployment of negative emission technologies, mainly uh, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage uh, is, is what's most prevalent in, in the models produced by the IPCC at scales that I think are hard to even comprehend. Um, so in our analysis, we, we complement everything else that's out there by saying that, well, let's not, let's assume, let's not be completely certain that these technologies will be possible to deploy at the scale that we think they, that many models assume. And, and let's say that, that they aren't possible to, to develop at that scale. What, how, does the, how does that change the, the, the climate mitigation challenge? And it changes it quite significantly. Um, and I guess we argue that it's a moral hazard to rely on something that we, we, there's so much uncertainty around. Um, so that's something that we can discuss later. Um, and what happens when we have this, these two starting points is that we have a far more challenging mitigation agenda than, than other analysis that's out there, basically. And yet we argue, besides these, if you take these two st starting points, we, have very, we use very conservative estimates when it comes to uh, is climate sensitivity and these sort of things. Uh, so one could argue that what we're, what we're presenting here is an absolute minimum of what would be required to live up to the Paris Agreement. Um, this discussion about negative emission technologies also, of course, connects to uh, discussions and debates going on between net zero targets um, and zero, zero, real zero targets, um, and also the role of offsetting. The, 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 basically, what, how, how big a role offsetting can play uh, in, in addressing climate change. Uh, we just recently, uh, together with uh, around 40 other uh, research colleagues, we uh, we published a debate article at uh, Climate Home News that you can read if you're interested in sort of these issues in more detail, why we're skeptical around negative emission technologies uh, and relying too much on them. Um, but anyways, back to the Paris Agreement. If uh, another way of looking at the global carbon uh, budget that's left is uh, using the metaphor of the pie. I think this is sometimes easier than graphs for some people to... to <laughs> To sort of to make it sink in that we have a finite, we have a global carbon budget pie, and this needs to be um, shared amongst all the world's nations. And if we want to follow the Paris Agreement, of course, in an equitable way, to some degree. And um, in our analysis that we did um, back in, well, about half a year ago, that was published, um, we calculated that 
the remaining um, uh, budget, um, and this can be a little bigger, a bit smaller, there's uncertainty around here, but uh, if we look at the energy related carbon emissions, so that's basically everything except process emissions from, from cement and also uh, the CO2 emissions that uh, result from land use change. Um, we have about 655 gigatons of carbon dioxide left on a global level to have any chance of living up to the uh, Paris Agreement's um, uh, temperature commitment. So that's well below 2 degrees C and um, pursuing 1.5. So this is not for 1.5. For 1.5, the budget would be much smaller. Uh, so we say that we're, well, we'll take the Paris Agreement at face value and the commitments there, and we make our interpretation of uh, the probability that would be reasonable to, to use uh, if we want to live up to those, um, uh, those commitments. And then in the next step, we, since there is a clear equity steer of the Paris Agreement, and this is kind of a rough division, of course, that could be um, nuanced and problematized, but we, we take the language of, of the UN as well, of developing countries and developed countries, or country parties. And basically, we, we start with developing heuristic scenarios, so sort of just um, sketching out scenarios for the developing countries that are much more uh, ambitious than any of the developing countries are saying <laughs> that they will be doing. So if you take China, for example, uh, we have assumed that uh, they would start uh, decreasing their emissions by 2025, rather than I think they're saying 2025 to 2030 now is the latest, uh, and then reaching zero emissions by somewhere around 2050 rather than 2060. So that's just to give you a taste a favor of what we've assumed for the developing country parties. And that we're so we're not let, letting them off the hook. In fact, they could argue that this is not a um, this is not a fair allocation of the remaining uh, carbon budget. But considering this very small size of the budget that's left, it's still something. If we want to live up to the Paris Agreement, that's still something we argue is necessary. Uh, and then we look in the second step. We look at well, how much uh, uh, is then left for the developed country parties, and. Um, after we've done that, we basically sketch out these uh, these graphs. Uh, so the, the the top one is the total emissions and then how they uh, would be developed. And the, the solid line is the developing country parties and the developed country parties is the dotted line at the bottom. Uh, so we get we can calculate sort of annual emissions reductions that uh, that these budgets lead to. Um, and you can also, I mean, of course, important in this graph is, of course, to acknowledge that if you look at the population of these two groupings, um, the people <laughs> emitting the, uh, the emissions re uh, related to the solid line are about 80% of the world's population. And the dotted line, so the developed country parties, so the ones that the countries that most of us are a part of probably um, are um, have about 20% of the world population. So that's just important to keep in mind when looking at these two graphs. And then what we do after that is we, we looked at different allocation principles based on equity principles um, to divide the, the budget that we've then calculated for the developed country parties um, to see how we can come up with a budget for Sweden. Um, and here we landed in, in, the, in the allocation principle or the apportionment regime of grandfathering. So basically letting historical emissions uh, over the la last few years determine um, future emissions uh, reductions that would be required of each country. Um, this could, there's arguments for and against this, but this is what we landed in was sort of still the most reasonable considering the, you know, the human development indexes and the GDP per capita that these countries have and the capacity for them to, to, um, um, to transition. Um, and this is all, of course, still very rough. So it's, it's, it hasn't really been done in this way before. So that's why it's also sort of, uh, it, even if it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a solid paper. It's it's one of the first papers that tries to do this with those assumptions that I laid out in the beginning. Um, and what we land in then basically is that Sweden's uh, for Sweden to be able to make a fair contribution to the Paris Agreement, we have a remaining carbon budget starting basically January 2020 of around 200 to 280 to 370 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, for this century and on onwards. Um, and that might not say a lot to, to those of you who aren't um, really uh, number nerds and know exactly the annual emissions of Sweden per, <laughs> per year, uh, but that's more or less uh, equivalent to six to eight years of current emissions. So it just shows the, the, the immense challenge that we're faced with if we really want to live up to our commitments. Um, and then what we did in, this, in, the, in the next step was to compare 
what we deem then is in line with the Paris Agreement with uh, what the current plans of Sweden are. So basically their current climate policy framework, which consists of a climate law and some climate targets. And we make optimistic assumptions about how Sweden um, actually will do what they've said they will do, and they will do so in a more ambitious way than it seems like they're aiming to do now. So this is still a conservative estimate, but we, we think that if Sweden would follow their um, current legislation, they would emit at least 800 megatons of carbon dioxide during this century. And what we're arguing is that uh, at the very least, you would have to keep uh, your emissions to 370. So basically, it's a factor of two at least difference between what one of the world's leading countries on, on sort of you know, developing progressive climate legislation in the developing uh, developed countries, at least industrialized countries. Uh, um, so it's, it's, it's the challenge is twice as challenging as, as Sweden has, has sort of committed to is basically our argument. And this results in emissions reductions that are, are you know, much more challenging and the ones that are, are currently being planned for, but also of course being seen because Sweden isn't even living up to their to the, what they've said they would be doing. So if we want to live up to the Paris Agreement, we argue that you would need to decrease your carbon emissions by 12 to 15% per year, starting 2020. And it's interesting to look at. I, I don't like too many comparisons to the corona pandemic because I think there's huge issues with how we've dealt with the, with the pandemic. That's another discussion. Uh, and also how the, the consequences of the pandemic and the responses to the pandemic, um, you know, how, how they play out in our societies. Uh, I think we're just starting to begin to understand the complexity around this um, and, the, and again, the importance of equity here. But if we look at this year, there was an, a sort of an estimate in May. I don't know if this was correct, but the estimate was that we would see about four to seven percent reductions globally um, during 2020. I haven't followed that up, actually, and I don't know if it's if the final numbers are out yet, of course, uh, but it just shows the sort of the, the scale of, of the challenge, I guess, in some ways. And we would need to aim in Sweden for a decrease of 80% reductions in carbon emissions by 2030. Um, that's all emissions uh, related to any uh, energy uh, use, basically. So transportation, industry, um, and uh, residential um, emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And we would need to achieve zero emissions by 2035 to 2040 instead of the uh, net zero targets that Sweden has now for 2045. Um, so going to the local level, I mean, then there's the next step of when we've calculated the national level budgets. Uh, a few years ago, we were contacted by a municipality who asked us uh, what it would mean for them to live up to the Paris Agreement uh, targets. Uh, so it was interesting. There was actually the question came from a municipality, Yarfella, which is a municipality in Stockholm's, uh, the Stockholm region. And they asked us this, and that's how our work started, basically trying to figure out, you know, how, how to sort of uh, bring this very global analysis down to the local level. Um, and what we landed in then and what we've continued working on is to work with territorial emissions statistics and territorial emissions. That does not mean that we think consumption based emissions is not important. I think it's hugely important. It's harder to quantify in some ways, harder to work with, um, but it's 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 needs to be considered. And of course, when one works at the local level, and decreases territorial emissions, we make, must make sure that consumption-based emissions don't, you know, uh, rise for one, for one, but also uh, also start uh, going down uh, rapidly. Um, I, one minute left. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I think we started a little bit later, but um, uh, but maybe if we want to keep to the schedule, we started five. No, minutes. It's, it's it's yours. Twenty-five minutes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Great. So then I have a few more minutes. <laughs> um, but if we look at city level municipal budgets, um, uh, yeah, we use grandfathering then also within uh, within Sweden uh, to allocate that um, the the national budget between the counties and the regions of Sweden. And I think this can be discussed as well if this is the best you know allocation principle or not. Um, there are issues with focusing just on territorial emissions and just focusing on sort of grandfathering, but there's also strengths in those, and we've paid, you know considered this quite a bit. Um, Here's a sort of summary of, of, uh, of this idea of going from a global carbon budget down to a city level budget, just kind of trying to provide an image um, and where you go from having sort of a quantification of including all greenhouse gas emissions um, and then uh, centering it down on, on sort of a Paris carbon budget. Um, and we use, I don't have time to go into the details here, but we 
we look at sort of uh, scenarios for cement production and cement related emissions because they really dominate industrial emissions uh, over the century and also uh, you know we make very optimistic assumptions around uh, deforestation and land use changes and these sort of things so when we focus on carbon and we focus on energy related emissions we also have to make assumptions around all the other emissions and basically in, in our analysis we 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 argued that we made very optimistic assumptions so this means that there's very little room for sectoral trading or offsetting between these various types of emissions and that's one of the reasons why we're very critical of a lot of the the offsetting as well is that there's so little space within all these different uh emissions uh, categories um and yeah so, basically sorry, sorry sec. um yeah. time's up but you can continue continue in the breakout session Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll just uh, I'll just show here's the the work we've done with the municipalities and cities in Sweden, and uh, these were our conclusions. Uh, so we can look at that screen as um, I'm zooming out here. Uh, but sorry, yeah, I thought since we started twenty past, I thought we had uh, five extra minutes, but I understand if we have to cut off. Thank you, Zach. Next up is uh, Heidi Sørensen from School Municipality. Feel free to share your screen. Yes, indeed. Um... Let's see if this works. Are you watching my screen now? Yes, maybe I want to put it in presentation mode. Yeah, I will I'll just wait. Great. Um, uh, there is some uh, problem on my side, just a minute. Hmm. Hmm. We could see the the whole screen before. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. You see the presentation now. Yes. And I can't see my own notes. That's just, that's where it's <laughs> that's not so good, <laughs> actually. Uh, but. Um, I'm not sure what to do with that because I was able to have two screens at the same time uh, where the other presentation was given, but no, I'm not allowed to undo my, to have another. Are you watching, can you now see the presentation or not? Uh, it's not in presentation mode right now. Huh? What? It's not in presentation mode now. It's not in presentation mode now. Because it, it is, uh, I have it, is it now in presentation mode? No, yeah. it's in presentation mode, yes. Yes, and when it's not in presentation, then I can't see my own. <laughs> yeah. I can't then see maybe my notes. I can, maybe I can show the presentation, then you see just the next Yes, one can I we do that? Is that, a, is yes, that a, if that's a solution, I stop sharing, because I think it will be best if, if I you have. Can, uh, I stop sharing. I think maybe you no, it's okay. Then I do. Sounds like a good solution. Yeah, that's good. Good to have a co worker. Sorry for that. I'm so grateful to be able to present for you some of the, these things are work we're really excited about. And the climate uh, budget, uh, you know, I guess that Oslo was the first city to announce one. And uh, now we are working on our fifth budget. Uh, it is actually basically a tool to meet climate goals. And I will today talk about how we develop the climate budget as an efficient governance system for Oslo and give you some advice on how to develop your own climate budget. The advices will be on base of the experience we have had in these years. Uh, we will look upon ourselves here as climate practitioners. We are in a, uh, as practitioners in a city. 
And this is um, for us a very central part of the climate work in Oslo. If then we go to the climate targets, uh, the climate uh, Oslo has implemented one of the most ambitious climate targets of any capital in uh, the world. In Oslo, we strongly believe that emission reductions are not to be implemented somewhere else at another time and by somebody else. We want to take responsibility now and our goals are in line with the Paris Agreement. Uh, Oslo has ambitious target by 2030. The goal is to reduce the direct emissions of the greenhouse gases by 95%. In other words, we try to be practically zero emission by 2030. Nevertheless, even if Oslo reach its zero emissions goal, the climate will continue to change. Therefore, we have a combined strategy, both looking at implementation and adaptation in Oslo. Governance is the most important thing when it comes to reaching climate goals. If you switch to the next one, update. One of the key challenges for reaching the Paris Agreement uh, is uh, the fragmentation of responsibility between global, national and local levels. In addition, there are often internal division within administration between those who think of money and those who think of emissions. We have taken measures to avoid this fragmentation in Oslo. We have introduced climate budget, whereby we seek to count carbon the way we count money, just like the financial budget. And the climate budget is the responsibility of the deputy mayor of finance. I can't underline strongly enough how important this is, but of course, uh, the deputy mayor of finance have solid techn technical support from the climate expertise in our environmental sector. I also want to emphasize the importance of capacities and institutions. Solving climate change requires new skills in public administration. We cannot expect to deal efficiently with issues without adjusting our organization. In Oslo, we have established a climate agency. This is the agency that I am directing. The agency is set up to provide te technical support and policy advices on climate measures to the city government, to all other city agencies, and to collaborate with private sector, research institution, and NGOs. If you then look uh, at the climate budget, the key tool to organize our climate work is this budget. The budget is a tool to authorize the climate goals and the climate strategy on annual basis. Uh, we were the first city in the world to introduce it and we used it for the first time in 2017. Together with the fiscal budget and we are now finishing with our fifth budget for 2021. The it is important to underline that the climate budget is fully integrated in the financial budget process. We are budgeting towards the future by identifying measures and instruments needed to reach our targets. The emission impact of each measure is estimated and the responsible unit for the implementation is identified. The budget is clear. This sounds perhaps very easy, and uh, but I will tell you in uh, city at the size of Oslo, this is a truly complicated process. But the budget clearly states that what has to be done by whom and when and at what, what cost. Uh, as we have seen already, a uh, climate budget can be developed in many forms. And I will focus on how we have developed the climate budget here in Oslo. If the look at the system boundaries. The first step in developing a climate budget is to define the system boundaries. There are many ways to do this. The budget can, for example, be developed in the city administration or the city as a geographical unit. And it all depends on what data, knowledge and resources you have available. Oslo's measures addresses all scopes from one to three. We are working on reducing both our direct emission and our entire footprint. With that said, it is important to keep them separate in measurement and accounting. 
in the climate budget, we only focus on the direct emission named as scope one. The Oslo climate budget covers emission from the city of Oslo as a geographical area, includes all emission sectors in available statistics and contains a combination of national, regional and local measure and a combination of quantified and non-quantified measures. If before you develop a climate budget, you have to know your historical greenhouse gas emissions. Here you can see the historical greenhouse gas emissions for Oslo, developed by the Norwegian Environmental Agency. They develop statistics for municipalities, municipalities in Norway with the same methodology as the, the greenhouse gas inventory in the IPCC 2006 guidelines. It concludes nine emission sectors and 38 emission sources. When you know your historical data, you can set up a climate budget. This is the framework for Oslo's climate budget in 2021. The green line shows the historical statistics and the green dotted line shows a projection of emissions in Oslo. The red dots are our climate goals and the yellow line shows our annual target. The projection very clearly demonstrates that business as usual will, be, will not lead to our ambitious target. Intense and extra effort and actions are needed. Therefore, we have implemented measures to reach our goals. For each annual budget, the measures are analyzed towards the target year. The methodology differs depending upon available data, knowledge and the measures and developments in the sector. It is important to keep in mind that not all measures can be quantified and that the effect cannot always be isolated to one measure or instrument. And, uh, the, to and the toolbox for mitigation action is a mixture of national, regional and local instrument. This is complicated, but should not avoid uh, stop you from try doing it because in the end of the day, that it is will be the measures who will take you to uh, achieve the goals. The limits, uh, here is the climate budget in Oslo for 2021. The, this is the, how we can see that uh, as you can see, we will achieve a reduction emission of 30% by 2023. And that is quite far from our ambitious targets to reach 22%. More action is definitely needed. I think so, time is almost up, so we can yeah. wrap it up. Maybe. So if we wrap up by say, how do we develop a climate budget? This is the, how we work in Oslo. Uh, if we go to the ne next, this is the budget process. It is, I just want to emphasize at the end that doing the climate budget in the ordinary budget project, uh, process is extremely important and gives also uh, substance and um, uh, putting climate in the very center of the political decision making is makes implementation of the measures in the budget much more easy. Uh, uh, and monitoring and reporting, uh, a climate budget is also an action plan. This is the climate budget is integrated in the ordinary monitoring and reporting system in, uh, in Oslo, and that is extremely important as well. So, uh, if I use two seconds on lessons learned, we, you have to start uh, where are the emission sources at your control. And you will f soon find out that there will always be uncertainties and we have to continuously work to further develop the technical side of a climate budget. This is groundbreaking work. So. There, is, there has been no textbook helping us. It is important not to be accused of cheating with numbers. So transparency is a, is a key and communication, communication efforts are always valuable. And collaboration within the city administration and with other cities and municipalities it will always give uh, added value. 
So just then want to finish with a little uh, picture, reminding us of that Oslo normally is a city with a lot of people, not now during the corona. And uh, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Heidi, and Astri for helping us out with the technical issues. Thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, in the program is Elina Seppanen from uh, Tampere Municipality. Welcome. Thank you. I'm just going to share you my screen. Um, so I come from Tampere, Finland. Um, can you see this? Yes. There we go. Okay, so Tampere is the second biggest city in Finland, uh, which means it's not that big. It's to about 240,000 people at the moment. And we started doing the climate budget in 2017. So I'm gonna share a little bit about what we've managed to do in Tampere and um, what we've done so far actually and what we're still developing. And of course, the most important thing is why we're doing a climate budget in the first place. So I think we've heard quite a lot about it already. Um, but still, from my point of view, I'm the climate and energy expert of the city or specialist. And um, my job, I think my most important job is the first point in the slide, providing information for decision-making. So we're at a point in climate work where we've tried things, we've piloted things, um, and now we need to make a big change, which has become very obvious based on the previous presentations. And that comes on a city level, it comes uh, with money, and the decision makers are the ones who can make that kind of things happen. So I think I have a lot of keywords that you've already heard today, this transparency. Um, like uh, Norm also just said, and transparency in what you've calculated is very important. But I think the first thing here is that we actually are more transparent about our climate work in general. We have done climate, very intense climate work in Tampere for more than 10 years, but there's very little uh, reported back to the public. And there's, uh, of course, monitoring our progress towards our targets of carbon neutrality and then the sufficiency of the actions. So all of these are sort of in one package when you, when you do a climate budget. Um, similar things that also just said, uh, it combines the city budget and financial statements with the climate work. So you need to be there in that official city budget process to make things happen. And uh, also to emphasize climate work and the financial plan process more. So this should come uh, more a topic when we talk about money. I was very happy to hear about that. Biden's statement. That's exactly what we're looking for. So like we or just stated, we need groundbreaking decisions. And for that, we need to provide information. And my job is to sort of take um, things like this presentation from Uppsala and uh, chew it down and make uh, sort of bring it to the decision makers so that I can bring the information that's relevant for my city and for the decisions that they're making and the climate impact of those decisions. Um, a few words about what climate budget is in Tampere, since we understand these things like climate budget and carbon budget still slightly differently. So we have the so-called uh, emissions budget. It's not exactly the carbon budget that you were talking about earlier. It's um, based on our percentage goal. So saying that we need to reduce our emissions at least 80% by 2030. We talk about compensating the rest, but I must admit that I fully agree with Uppsala that it's kind of hard to it's it's kind of hard to see where that compensation will come from at the moment. Then we have the financial budget, which is the climate actions and the money that we're spending on those actions and so on. So we have both of these sides in our climate budget. So how how have we done this so far? Uh, it actually happened so that the city's financial office contacted us. I, I work for the uh, Climate and Environmental Policy Unit, and they said that they would like to have a climate budget. And luckily, we've just been like, getting to know the Oslo system. 
and decided that, okay, let's, let's do a climate budget and see what we have. Um, at first, we were on a very tight schedule. The budget was almost ready in 2019 when we first got this call. So the first climate budget was very short, but uh, we took also climate budget as a starting point. That's what we are sort of aiming for. And this first budget was included in the financial plan of 2020. Uh, and it only included, included an emissions budget. It looks simple enough, but uh, like Heidi already said, there's a lot of, there's a hundred questions behind it. And a reliable, transparent uh, emissions projection is really a very essential thing that you need. The second budget that we did for this year, uh, Last year was uh, included also actions and euros, so climate actions from the city units, uh, and then the cost of those actions were included in the second budget. And now we're working on the third budget, budget that's planned for next year and plan to collect more data from city units in, in order to be able to calculate the emission impact of those actions. So we're going sort of step by step, which uh, makes a gradual change in the financial process. And it gives us a bit of room to choose what's relevant since we have very few resources to work on the climate budget. Well, I guess the basic question when we come to a climate budget is helping us to see to the horizon, like is that the path that we're taking? Is it going towards a, the climate neutral city, the carbon neutral city that we talk about? Or is it maybe off the bat and how much? And then when we look at the actions that we're planning, we have a whole roadmap coming up uh, soon in English also from Tampere. There's like 400 actions in there. So we need to know a little bit more about which ones are the important uh, bigger steps and which ones are the smaller steps towards that path. There's always that uh, hope that we can choose the most important ones. And, or this demand comes from the politician side that I, I have the feeling that the truth is we need to do everything possible and we will still uh, not be on that path necessarily. So a few words about the emissions budget and then a few words about the financial budget. Uh, I personally work with the emissions budget, so I can go deeper into that. And I noticed Em is here. She's our uh, specialist on the financial budget side. This is just a visualization of what we're trying to achieve. So there's the 2030 target is to get 80% of emissions less than we had in 1990. There's our current latest uh, data that we have from 2018. And then there's the budget that we just decided for 2021. So you can see that our ma major emissions come from traffic and district heating. Electricity is not a big issue uh, since we have a very clean electricity production, but then we have some issues with waste, etc. And uh, this is an, uh, like a scope one, scope two budget, basically. So a geographical aerial budget. Uh, we do have actions for scope three, but like some people already mentioned, then it's really hard to take that into account when actually calculating emissions. We're going to need a lot more research for that. But also that could be a step-by-step -step approach in my opinion. So this is the actual emissions budget that we had for 2021. Mm -hmm. It really requires a trans reliable and transparent projection. This one is based on an old one from 2016. Did I still have trouble getting behind the scenes and, and looking at what's really been done there? Last year, I actually created a, a projection for our, own, for our city myself, and we'll be working with Gausal to develop that further in, in this spring. But that, that's also something that's going to be published completely. So uh, at first in English, <laughs> at first in Finnish though, but it's also a transparent tool that I would like to share with everyone. And this emission budget would allow us to estimate where we are. Uh, for example, district heating looks bad, but it's actually, we know more or less how to get to the target, at least close to it. But when it comes to the traffic budget, we're far from where we're supposed to be this year. And I don't see much happening in the way that we'll actually reach this, this goal, target in 2030. Then we have the financial budget. One uh, minute left. It's like also, yes. 
One minute. One minute. Okay, so the financial budget is also four years, just like Oslo's. And uh, so far we've had like, only certain costs included. Um, and like I said, when it comes to the emissions, we're going to start developing further to gather more data and see the emission impact of those actions that were listed in the budget. But I think a bit by bit, we're sort of providing more and more information for uh, the city government, how to, what the impact of their decisions are. So a few, just a few points of our final observations on what we've done so far. Uh, we try to keep it simple. So you can start small. The first budget really was just the, what you saw before about emissions, but it's still actually, I learned from it. Uh, it was very well received by the, um, by the politicians and also got a lot of attention. And I think that's all important. You don't need to make it too complex and avoid heavy reporting. This is something that we, at least in our organization, they don't like. And you can develop step by step. Uh, it requires development of data management, but I think we're all onto that already. Digitalization, all this. And of course, what you, what you produce as information needs to be something that's useful and something that you can utilize. So um, the, you can use that information to sort of help your hit city get on the right track. And this, uh, then you have numbers to sort of prove it. If there's a lot of questions on what to include, what not to include, what can you count, what can you not count. But even, even though it's not perfect, that information, then it still helps to discuss these things. Okay. That's all from my part. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alina. Very interesting. And remember that you can all uh, deepen the discussions in the breakout sessions later on. So next up is uh, Sveko. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, do you see my screen now? Yes. Yes, I'll say, okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Sjöholm and I work as a digital development lead at Sveco. Uh, most of you maybe know what Sveco is, but uh, to, uh, to the other ones, I can say that we are one of Europe's leading consultancy companies and we are very strong in Northern Europe, but we have assignments all over the world with offices both in India and China, for example. Uh, and uh, what we do, we plan and design the sustainable communities and cities of the future. Uh, and we are very strong in all things uh, relating to sustainability and climate and the city planning and architecture and energy and, and so on. And uh, today we will uh, shortly introduce two of our things that we work on. Uh, one is carbon cost and one is causal climate watch that we have a cooperation with. So I will uh, very short uh, leave over to Anna Emilia, my colleague, who will tell you more about carbon cost. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, my name is Anna Emilia Jolson and I work as head of sustainability at Sveco infrastructure segment in Stockholm. And today I will talk a method that, uh, about the method that Sveco has developed that's called carbon cost management. And it's a method that is relevant to anybody who has a climate budget or who is going to build something. And it also works for all types of projects from small uh, real estate projects to projects that covers entire cities, for example, infrastructure projects. So, our consultants, they are often told that it costs too much to work to reduce the climate impact in the, in the projects they are working in. Uh, and a couple of years ago, some consultants at Sveco started to doubt that this was really the case and started a development project where they looked at climate impact and cost from different parts of the construction site, for example, drainage or pa um, pavements. And the results are shown here in the diagrams. Apart, uh, uh, in the blue bars, you can see the, the climate impact, the carbon, and then the yellow lines, you can see the costs. And this result became uh, shockingly clear to us that climate impact, carbon, and costs are strongly related. So next, thank you. 
uh, if we plot this relationship, uh, we can show, show that from, if we work from an early uh, phase in the project process with reducing the project's climate impact, we automatically reduce the, car, uh, the cost of the project. And this connection is to, to up to a point where it's possible to choose from more climate friendly materials. And then the connection is broken. And that's something that we call the carbon cost tipping point. And carbon cost tipping point, it's not a set place, but something that moves when carbon friendly materials gets more common on the market. So now we can always respond to the argument that it costs too much to uh, uh, reduce the climate impact. And this is not rocket science, but until now, climate impact and cost has always been uh, calculated as two separate parameters in most construction and building projects. So if we use this carbon cost management method, it is possible to choose the carbon reduction measures that uh, gives you most carbon reduction for the money so that the customer in the end has money enough to save even more carbon. That was everything from me. Hope to meet you in the breakout session. Thank you. And over to Christopher. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Anna Emilia. Uh, and um, very short from my side, I would say that Svekwas established a cooperation with Causal. Uh, and uh, we really want to offer the best, very best solutions to our customers. And uh, when it comes to how municipalities and cities can monitor, communicate, and simulate their climate targets. We think that uh, Causal Climate Watch is the best we have found. Uh, they are a startup company from Helsinki, and uh, we now have their CEO, Sonia, who will tell you more about their solution. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, is it visible now? Yes. Okay. Yes, hello, my name is Sonia Maria Ignatius. I'm CEO at Causal and super happy to tell you today about our service that helps to make the climate targets actionable and measurable and also set the emission budget to different sectors. Uh, before founding the company, I used to work at the city of Helsinki as a climate change expert. Mm, maybe some of you know that Helsinki has a very ambitious climate strategy that encompasses also many different sectors. But when it comes to the monitoring of this action plan, we encountered a couple of challenges. First of all, we had 150 actions, so it was quite difficult to know what was going on with each one of them. Let's take one action as an example. Helsinki is supposed to install a lot of solar power, but to know what is going on with this action, we used to send once a year emails to people to remind them, hey, please fill a huge monster spreadsheet and we ask, okay, how is it going now? And sometimes we would find out that they had been falling behind the schedule and they had some problems already a couple of months ago. So it was kind of late already. So besides this problem that we couldn't keep track of what was going on with all these actions, we had another problem which was that we didn't know what was even supposed to be going because we knew what was the Helsinki's overall emission target, but we couldn't allocated to different sectors. And we didn't know how much solar power the city would be needing to build in the first place. Yeah, we had some idea, of course, about the impact because we had um, purchased a couple of consultant studies, but the problem was that they were not transparent and they were always like a snapshot that got outdated super quickly. So we always had to purchase a new one, which was very slow and also expensive. So to tackle these challenges, we piloted a service that helps to, the city to see what's actually going on and helps to see also what investments are still needed to become carbon neutral. And our pilot turned out to be quite successful and we heard that other cities wanted to use it too. So we started our company Causa last spring and we developed the pilot into a scalable service now that can be used by any city. And with Causa Climate Watch, you can keep track and have confidence about the progress all the time. You can also predict what is the situation and what is the development of the city, so you can create realistic climate budgets based on that information. 
You can also understand what is happening and why it's happening. So you can use the best information to back the decision making. And you can make the climate actions visible for everyone with open data, including citizens. So when you have a better overview of what is happening and why, you can concentrate the efforts on the right place. And we are happy to collaborate with five Finnish cities now. And one of our new customers is Tampere, as you heard from Elina Seppanen's presentation before, they are doing really pioneering work. And we are very excited to work with them this spring to develop this budgeting further and also use it hopefully to support decision making, in, I mean, political decision making. So we believe that visualizing data is not enough. You have to make the data also actionable. And with our solution, you can help to make sure that the climate targets become actions and don't remain such strategic talk. And we are super excited to work together with Sveco to collaborate and combine their sustainability expertise with our advanced data platform to support cities in their climate smart, climate smart actions. So I'm happy to tell you more in the breakout session. So hope to see you there. And now back to Christopher, thanks. Yeah, very shortly. Uh, thanks you so much, Sonia, for presenting Kausal. Uh, and I think our 10 minutes soon has gone. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the breakout sessions uh, shortly after this. And note that there will be two different sessions for from Sveco, one for the carbon cost with Anna Media and one with Kausal Climate Watch with Sonia. And I will also be with the Kausal Climate Watch. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I will leave the word to Alexander Boll from Asplan Viak. Yes. Um, let me just share my screen. There we go. I hope everyone is able to see it now. Good. good. Thank you so much for uh, letting us uh, in Asplan Viak talk to you here today. I will talk about how we, um, yeah, what tools we have for uh, managing the carbon footprint of municipalities and also like generally how we work. Um, so Aspan Viak, we are one of Norway's leading consultancy firms in the field of planning, architecture and engineering. Um, and we have uh, yeah many offices throughout the whole of Norway, which allows us to uh, get in contact with um, people all over Norway. Now with uh, COVID, we are also, everyone is staying at home, but um, net meeting should also make it easier to contact people outside of Norway as well. So I will talk about a little bit about uh, carbon footprint assessments and how we, how we work here. So uh, when we talk about the carbon budget for a municipality, uh, often we divide this into different scopes. So uh, the most uh, known is definitely scope one. In a municipality, this will be all the emissions that are caused uh, directly in the, inside the geographical area. And then you also have scope two, which is pur purchase electricity, even though it could be pr produced uh, outside of uh, the geographical area. But then this one, scope th three, is very interesting. Um, it is uh, the carbon footprint of everything that is bought uh, from services or goods that are brought into the um, area, but also the emissions themselves will often happen somewhere completely different. Like for a construction material, it could be produced in China, but we still should uh, account for it. So that's how we are thinking. Um, so if we look at... Um, scope one emissions or only the direct emissions. We have worked together with many municipalities to uh, get an overview over the emissions and we can do projections pretty easily. In this case, um, we see that road transport has a very, very important part in this municipality. So we have looked at measures to reduce like uh, how and what is the impact of more electric vehicles? How many can we expect in the future to get there? So these are all interesting analyses and we help uh, also develop tools which are tailor-made for the municipality that they can use further on. And also to see if they are in line to reach their uh, targets. In this case, 
50% uh, reduction could be quite uh, possible because Norway has a lot of electric vehicles, but we see also a large part of the uh, fleet uh, will not be electrified by 2030. So if you are going to go f further, um, what do you do then? But, but what about indirect emissions? In the same municipality, we looked at the construction of a new highway. Um, and we were quite surprised. Uh, we also have separate tools that look, for instance, for the building project. What is the carbon footprint of, of this project? Uh, only the uh, total, total direct emissions, or the indirect emissions, or the footprint, total footprint was 400,000 ton CO2 equivalent for building this huge uh, highway. And when we compare this with the carbon budget of the municipality of around 150,000 tons, there is clearly a large part that is missing. And also if you look at the direct emissions itself, it's uh, quite, quite shocking that only this uh, one building of highway, although it happens over many years, could have a very large impact that maybe is not covered in the action plan that only looks at direct emissions. So uh, most uh, accounting of uh, carbon and budgeting only looks at scope one and two, but uh, in our service, we also include uh, the life cycle or the carbon footprint. And we see for many sectors, uh, the green here is uh, the indirect emissions, the footprint, it will dominate. So it is very, very important to include it. Um, so our tool has been used by about 200 municipalities, uh, including the largest cities in Norway, to get an overview over their uh, organizational footprint. Um, and it's also used by multiple organizations and sectors uh, for larger assessments, for instance, of the, uh, for the University of Oslo, what is their carbon footprint? footprint um, and also for the Norwegian building and construction sector to make detailed analysis. And we have a uh, web module where you can report your, uh, your data yourself, uh, which is more of a simpler solution, which is used by around 200 companies. Uh, if we look at uh, our own carbon footprint, this uh, graph to the right is what we used to report before we had climate cost. And now we see like everything that is, was not included in uh, the traditional accounting how much of a difference it could actually make. Um, so uh, this is just one example of the e easier solution that we have where you can just re register your own uh, carbon footprint and it will also compare with a uh, um, average of your organization or uh, also for the municipalities. We can link this up with, with uh, the accounts and quite simply get a carbon footprint analysis, which then can be more detailed uh, uh, as a detailed assessment. Um, but what about the household footprint? Because we know that uh, we have looked at direct emissions happening in the municipality, this we do, and uh, the footprint of the, of the municipality's organization or uh, municipal services. We have also mapped the carbon footprint of an average Norwegian household, and we see that uh, both housing, food construction, and transportation is very important. Together, accounts for about seventy percent. So, how do we work about towards this uh, consumption uh, reduction or sustainable consumption? So, first of all, for municipalities, the urban planning will obviously play a central role uh, in reducing emissions. Uh, both from transport, uh, where, where we choose to build, and housing, um, how we build the buildings that we, we have. Um, but we have also other tools that can be uh, used more to nudge uh, users towards uh, changing their lifestyles um, in form of, for instance, uh, climate challenges or, or use more uh, big data to to uh, get a better overview and maybe also help towards uh, yeah, uh, informing people of their own uh, footprint. 
so that was what I was going to say quite uh, quite quickly. Um, in the breakout room, I also want to uh, uh, have an open discussion with you, what kind of tools would be interesting, um, and also give a little bit more detail how um, how we work in different sectors, both municipal sectors and for household uh, footprint. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I leave the word directly to Anders Hegestad. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. <clears throat> So uh, my name is Anders Hegestad, and I uh, am the CEO of a non-profit company uh, called Klimatsekretariatet, based in Stockholm, Sweden. I am here to talk about uh, and to make, give a short presentation of our digital carbon budget tool, Climate Visualizer. And uh, earlier today, most of you heard Matti Wetterstedt from Uppsala University talk about their leading research regarding how to calculate basically local carbon budgets. And this is the same exact research that our tool is based on, and perhaps also a development of the work that has been performed at Uppsala University. Um, um, so I would like to start where Martin Wetterstedt ended by discussing a little bit uh, what makes carbon budgets special and what differentiate them from targets focusing on point years. And I'd like to do this uh, by diving into our tool uh, and demonstrate uh, it. So let's see if I can share my screen. There we go. So, are you with me? Uh, can yeah. you see my shared screen with some kind of uh, uh, text and an image of a tower? Yes. Yep, we can see it. Great. So we are looking at the New Shopping Municipality Carbon Budget. This one is actually published already on the internet. And uh, I'd like to start with the, the, the view that we call an overview. Here we say, see a playback of the CO2 emissions in the New Shopping municipality since 2000, the year 2000, and that is the red dots. The gray dots to the right represents New Shopping's remaining carbon budget. That is the volume of CO2 that New Shopping can still emit without exceeding what is permitted by the Paris Accord. So in this uh, picture, the gray dots, the remaining carbon budget are arranged in a scenario suggesting how New Shopping could phase out their CO2 emissions within the scope of their remaining carbon budget. And in this suggested scenario, you can see if New Shopping were to follow this path representing a mitigation rate of 17.7% per year. They are to reach close to zero CO2 emissions around the year of 2045. But there are many ways to <clears throat> um, um, plan uh, a carbon budget and there are many scenarios and pathways to net zero. So in another view, we allow for users to investigate different paths and scenarios. Um, and basically to investigate the scope and the limits of the local carbon budget. So here we see New Shopping's historical emissions. Now they are gray and to the left. The remaining carbon budget is here represented as red dots. And here we see uh, a scenario where emissions uh, stay the same. In such a scenario, um, 
we are uh, so and, you, and what i'd also like to add that you can always hover on any given year in our uh, tool and get some extra feedback information um, so what would happen if uh, we were to keep emissions constant as in this scenario for yet uh, um, a couple of years well then we can go to the settings and we can uh, adjust the starting year, assuming that we will continue our emissions on current levels for two or perhaps three or four years. And we can see how that affects the remaining carbon budget. You can also adjust how many uh, percent, uh, the amount of, uh, of reduction rate, percent of reduction rate. And in that sense, experiment with different scenarios. You can break this down to sector level and investigate scenarios where you adjust mitigation rates for each subsector of emissions in new shifting. For instance, like this. What you always have here is a feedback and overview of historical emissions, giving you an overview and, and, and of where the larger uh, emissions uh, uh, and the challenges. Um, we also offer views where you can investigate further specific sectors on municipality level and look at subsectors of emissions. always with the possibility to investigate a certain year. So, um, I think I'll stop there, just giving you a quick insight to, to the tool that we have developed. And uh, moving on to another presentation. Thanks a lot, Anders. Sorry, sorry, I'm not done yet. I just want to uh -huh. give you, show you a couple of slides. I still have a couple of minutes, have I? Yes, another yeah. presentation of your own, I see. Yes. yes. Please go on. Okay. So I'm trying to share a screen here. It's a little complicated. Hmm. Okay, maybe I have to skip that. Yeah, um, and try to do that in the breakout room. Yeah, so then I just end by saying, um, um, we should take a step back. What has happened in Sweden, I think, is that we see the beginning of a de facto standard for how to calculate carbon budgets. Leading researchers from Manchester and Uppsala University has established a model. This model has recently been um, uh, approved by the Science-Based Target Network uh, or incorporated uh, into their uh, guidance for cities. Um, and we have some 40 plus regions and municipalities in Sweden who have adopted this method. At Klimat Sekretariatet, we have created a tool that basically make it possible to calculate, keep update and publish as a pedagogic visual tool, uh, a concurrent carbon budget. And um, we look for, uh, forward to talk to you. And we are interested in finding collaborative projects and pilot projects around the globe as we internationalize uh, this spring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anders. And I, I really agree with you. It's really important to be able to show everyone what's going on in, in the city and not just within the the city administration, uh, because you could see from Asplan Viek that our, our consumption patterns um, really has a high impact for, from all of us. So uh, thank you very much. We will now go into the breakout session um, part of this webinar.
Well, welcome back. And I really hope you've had some good discussions. And uh, I would just like to remind you uh, that this has been uh, recorded. So uh, if you want to share it in your networks, please feel free. Uh, I would like to thank everyone who has been participating today. And uh, uh, as this project is now uh, closing, um, uh, there are other Nordic possibilities um, when it comes to climate related networking and knowledge sharing. So we're also running a, a project called Nordic Transition Partnership for Climate Neutral Cities in 2030. So there will be a, a workshop series on um, starting next week already, if you're interested in learning more about how the Nordics work with these issues. So on that note, I would just like to say thank you again, and um, please um, stay in touch if you have any questions or would like to get in touch with, with anyone. Uh, we will try to help you with that. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent, yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.